This, 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 this show is brought to you by Safety FM. Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the Jay Allen Show. Yes, I know it is Friday, but this is not going to be a Safety FM Mini. Just want to give you the fair warning. So here's what's going on today. As I've had the opportunity to get to meet all kinds of different people. Today, I have a conversation with Flobo Boyce. He is a comedian, master of ceremonies, and an award-winning DJ. Now, I have to tell you, I did find Flobo hanging out online on this website called Matchmaker.fm. It's kind of one of those websites where you can find people to interview. But I have to tell you, Flobo has changed a lot of things as of recent. And I'm talking about when it comes to the world of streaming. So I took the opportunity to hang out with Flobo for us to discuss different things about himself and also the impact of streaming on what we do day in and day out. So I hope you sit back and enjoy this special edition of the Jay Allen Show instead of this traditional Safety FM Mini today. So take a listen and enjoy this conversation with Flobo Boyce on the Jay Allen Show, where we talk about everything. Enjoy it now. Safety FM. Changing safety cultures. One, one broadcast and one podcast at a time. Okay, that's cool. I used to live in Florida back in the day. I, I'm sorry. I apologize already for that. <laughs> it was college, man. Got in, got the paper, got the hell out. <laughs> what, what what area in Florida, if you don't mind me asking? I, I went to Flagler. So, oh, uh, oh, St. Augustine, such a beautiful city. I was the only black guy there with a college degree. <laughs> <laughs> so that had to be an interesting experience because that is definitely like an older city, um, ghost town, of course, depending on how, you know, how you want to relive the, the college life. Oh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I came from Brooklyn, if you can imagine that. So going from a metro area of 11 million people to 11,000, <laughs> when things close at like 6 p.m., that was my 18 to 21, man, living large. Woo! Well, no, I mean, it's, it's a different world over there. I mean, any, anytime that you come to Florida, you know that it's a retirement community, regardless, with the exception of Miami. Miami is just a kind of a miniature right. version of Cuba. Yeah. Um, but everything else is just kind of one of those things where, yeah, I mean, it gets a little bit later in the day and it's done. It's pretty much over, yeah. But I was, I really wanted to go to out of, out of state, and it was dirt cheap at the time. To oh, yeah. Well, so, I mean, New York to Florida, everything's oh, yeah. dirt cheap in comparison. <laughs> but even a private college, man, a private college was pretty cheap, and, and it was like 10,007, like everything. Full mm-hmm. meal plan at the time. And so I made a big campaign. My parents, my parents were like, fine <laughs> just if you fail it's okay we got columbia got NYU. <laughs> just, just go have some fun and so i stuck with it but uh so yeah. what about the so what about the communication program there at flagler kind of got you excited leaving new york to go there oh at the time it was like uh you know you got to to, to do news and i like the more gra- on the ground stuff this is before the florida man thing became mm-hmm. like a thing but like, mm-hmm. there's, there's a city with the beaches there's a city with the the alligator farm it was the, the the ghost hunting stuff. I was a history buff. You know, my parents are Caribbean. So like the whole like the new world discovery thing was cool. I thought it would be a cool place to start. And then I got through it. I was like, I want to do film. And I totally <laughs> crap canned my first four years of news <laughs> gathering to do film instead. So, yeah. so but here's the interesting aspect on the stuff that we were able to find about you. You've done a lot of interesting things from where you started to where you're at. I mean, the the. The earliest we could find was yeah. production assistant. We'll say a bank, just in case if you don't want to call him out by name. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That was it. That was actually what changed my life. It's it's Citigroup at the time. Mm, sure. I, I wasn't sure. Now. I wasn't sure. Some people hate their former employer, so I was like, I don't want to say it. And then Flo will be like, and then Flo will be like, I'm out. I'm out. I'm not talking to you. I got plenty of those employers <laughs> I hate, but uh, yeah, it was. Uh, wow, you have a team. That's what's up. Um, <laughs> I was going to go into finance. When I was in high school, I was in this program called the Academy of Finance. And uh, the idea was to put you in these internships uh, during the summer between junior and senior year, your senior year. 
to get into the more of the real world, real world stuff. The Academy of Finance was co-founded by Sandy Weil, who at the time was CEO of Citigroup. So a lot of the internships were at that bank. And so I went there at 17 years old, my only shirt buttoned down, uh, and and they looked at my resume and said, hey, you know, you know Photoshop. And this was like the old Photoshop, <laughs> 5.5. You know what I mean? Like it was before the cool stuff. I was like, yeah. So they threw me into media services. And so they call that industrials. But to me, it was a whole different world. I didn't have to wear a suit. I got to create stuff to make a company look good. And that internship actually changed my entire perspective as to what I want to do in my life. So corporate finance was great. The money was great on the table. But I was like, I wanted to create and not wear a tie. Well, uh, and uh, hopefully that's the angle you were able to go with when (laughs) it was all said and done. I mean, it's a crazy winding road. I think I'm still in live entertainment. Yeah, sure. But like, yeah, I, I go back to that particular former employer. <laughs> and I realized that it was just a game changer. Well, but here's the thing. You've done quite a few things throughout your career. And we'll talk about some of those if you don't mind. And I, I have to tell you, I thought it was kind of funny on how we're able to find each other. You found me on Matchmaker, which automatically, people automatically think that it's a dating website, especially oh. when you start you start going through the description. Oh, yes, I'm interviewing somebody from matchmaker.fm. What? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I hear you, man. I was like, I'm going to go try this. How does this work? <laughs> Be gentle. Yeah. So, and what I loved was your comment when you responded back. You, you and I went back and forth. You were like, I am not sure what a safety F them is which i love that that's always the best part when i hear something like that because that's the thing we what we do is we actually talk about safety mostly but what i like to do is interview people that have nothing to do with safety at the same time too but you're in a career aspect where you're doing a lot of online stuff you've actually done real world stuff for a major media group yeah which i can name if you want me to i'm never sure everything (laughs) okay i just want just want to make sure (laughs) so you did some stuff with fox and so you you've been there so now you're seeing a lot of the stuff coming into the in-home streaming, a lot of people trying to do all of this. Where are we getting lost in translation? Because I'm sure you're noticing that people are not doing a great job. They're trying their best, but we're still losing some of the, some of the platform from the major media. What do you think? You know, when everything shut down oh, a year ago, wow, uh, <laughs> <laughs> about this time a year ago, uh, it really was like the gold rush all over again. For for a second there, when these giant companies didn't know how to pivot because you're at the Titanic, right? How they change. It was like, well, how do we try to bring these experiences out there? I come from, now I am a comedian. Now I DJ weddings. How do we do this virtual thing that these big guys aren't doing yet? And I really thought that was a kind of cool thing. But, you know, whenever there's money involved, there's resources and there's rich billionaires being like, okay, okay, how do we get back on top? I mean, it was only a matter of time until we, now things look more and more slicker for these co- kind of companies. But I think the, the loss in translation thing really comes from uh, a change of what is important and what isn't. I had to be told by the world that what I did at live entertainment was non-essential and I was in my feelings for a long time uh, during the lockdown, but then really to focus on what was important and what wasn't. So like on the comedy side of things, I got to dabble in music. I got to dabble in putting levity to my podcast more than saying, okay, if it's not a joke, if it's on stage, it doesn't count. <laughs> you know? Well, you say that, but your podcast and some of the streams that you do don't always just go about anything related to comedy and music and so on. You are heavily involved. What's my hidden love that I don't discuss a lot about <laughs> with wrestling. Yeah. You, you talk about wrestling. I, I'm kind of shocked that I don't see the belt in the background because I normally see it in some of your other shots. The yeah. belt back there, I don't see it currently. Well, since um, the holidays, they think I got, rag- I got dragged for it. So I've been <laughs> doing more of the LED. Just, I used to have the belt in the back, yeah. Right. So you do have a love for professional wrestling. And recently you had somebody on that does the after show for 83 weeks. I will yeah. tell you, I have loved Bischoff for as long as I can remember. Yeah. Um so where did the love come about for professional wrestling for you? Uh, since day one. Uh, and, uh, I grew up in New York where WWF was the local federation because back then they were like territories and stuff. Right. So right. it's cool to see him like my homie blow up. Hey. <laughs> 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 uh, but but after cartoons on Saturday and Sunday, you'll have an hour of these live superheroes, mm-hmm. and they'll they'll. Pu- and the thing is, you didn't know that on the weekend shows they gave you like, mm-hmm. the second tier or third tier stars. So right. I was a huge fan of like Duke the Dumpster Drozzy, <laughs> and, and like Tatanka was my hero because he never lost the yeah. match for like two years back. In the Tito day. Santana was big on that weekend show too. Like, That's what I'm talking about. Uh-huh. See, it's like no one ever talks about those guys, man. What's up? Uh, but, but the thing is, it's to me to this day, it's the it's the best character work on television i tell people it's like shakespeare in the round for the masses and i get laughed at usually Mm -hmm. but but to answer your question when i do my show which is called draped in gold where we cover nxt and nxt uk 
I treat it as if it's like Skip and Shannon Undisputed or Speak for Yourself. I'm not going, I don't know what they're writing this week. It sucks. It's like, <laughs> oh my God, Seth Rollins has come back. What's that mean for his squad, Jack? And I really, right. the fact it's so hyper realistic, it becomes absurd and therefore a lot more fun to listen to. So. Well, I mean, the thing is that a lot of people don't understand some of the psychology that comes out of professional wrestling. And I think yes. that if people could kind of understand some of the things that are related there how it translates so much better over now this might be slightly controversial but if you take a look at some of the aspects of what donald trump did at his original when he was trying to run for president back in Mm -hmm. 2016 it looked like he had taken a page out of mcmahon's book uh, and how he was running it at least that's my opinion what do you think that is absolutely true so i'm gonna try to tread lightly here because i know (laughs) trump will have their feelings i know (laughs) but but, but like you think about the structure of what a primary is it's you and and any many many other opponents in your camp and you look at someone like president trump who took each opponent and found one thing one weakness and hammered it over and over again you go you know what Jeb Bush doesn't get excited enough. You know what I mean? Like, and so people went with the guy because if it makes you feel something, if you connect with someone. I live in Los Angeles today. And once you go out of Los Angeles proper, like into the mountains or down south, there's, there's a lot more of Trump supporters. And when you say, hey, look, what about this individual that you like so much? Because in LA, it's like, wait, we don't. But if you go outside, you say, why is it? They go, well, he tells it like it is. He is speaking to me. And mm-hmm. that's universal doesn't matter if you play the cello. It doesn't matter if you own a business. If people feel something, what you create, then it's a done deal, man. <laughs> right. It's it's the undisputed era with him. No, I'm joking. I'm joking <laughs> exactly. as, I, as, as I say that. Boom, <laughs> so I have a, so, some strange questions. I know that you talked a little bit at the beginning what, you, what you've been doing. So right now, I know that you, you have your own entertainment company. Yeah. And it looks yeah. like you assist people in regards of, building some of their plans do you go as far in as in streaming and helping out people with doing the setup and doing the proper way and kind of getting the whole thing set up as well if you would ask me that two months ago i would have said no but the answer is yes i do now uh, i do everything i do everything there's there's actually a show on youtube i had to put it over too much it's called mm-hmm. more please and that mm-hmm. was a very a simple situation a host that had a lot of real world gigs that got kind of cut off at the pandemic and wanted to do a live show and of course winter trained on camera fully it's a bit of a learning curve to learn the technical stuff right. uh, and so it, it becomes like i just want to be the talent and so it was asked to me to, to run that board and yeah so what i do is to start off in the real world the entertainment consulting side was more for like djs and florists and photographers that wanted to get their brand out there in the southern california wedding space because i'm not sure if your listeners know this southern california is the most popular place in the, in the country to get <laughs> married Fifty thousand weddings so just get yourself a of that pie mm-hmm. uh, but, but as far as like your own like web shows and stuff like that that's part of it too uh consulting work people have questions about what's the best strategy that also and then uh, my own network has grown because of it because <clears throat> to uh, basically to uh, apply for any kind of aid i had to basically show the government that I'm legitimate. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I had to actually like document everything and show them the books and all that stuff too. So I felt more real doing that now with a virus on the loose than ever before. So when you start teaching people about this, do they normally come to you from scratch where they have no concept whatsoever of what's going on? So do they even understand the difference between a DSLR and a webcam and all that kind of fun stuff? Or is it, it kind of no, and we're going from, from the bottom up? everyone's either kick the tires. And, and so when I say that, I mean like there's either people with, with no knowledge whatsoever or the, the Google university graduate that goes, you know what I heard? I was like, cool, you could drop 10 grand on a rig, but if you don't have any content to put on it, then what's the mm-hmm. point? And so, like, a good rig. Of, yeah, it sure is nice. <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. So when you start doing the, this development and you've assisted these people in regards of actually moving forward and doing all the stuff they do, do they bring you all kinds of different kinds of content then? I mean, are you seeing a little bit of everything or are they looking especially specifically what you're doing inside of your space? I think people look and see what I'm doing as far as the host structure and writing. That's one thing no one really takes time to look at, uh, how your show should be structured because you got to give people the Big Mac so they know what it mm-hmm. tastes like every week. Uh, right. but what, what I've seen is that everyone has their own flavor. Uh, whether it's a thing I wouldn't touch, like fantasy, or things I cannot touch, like uh, Mexican American culture. What I've seen is kind of a cool, like a graduate class of how people took the information and interpreted. So, are you going to do? A, are you going to do one of these sessions too, where you kind of have a master class or a blueprint where people can sign up? Because you know that's the most popular thing now. I have a master class. I have a blueprint that you can you can follow <laughs> and copy for the slow price of. 
No. <laughs> like, the trailer videos are a lot more entertaining. Uh, it's something I think about. I write things down, but like I feel like when I was in film school, I respected the teachers more who did stuff. They came back, right? I'm still on my journey. So I don't want to be that guy who had the, the one short film being like, you know what I've seen in my experience? So maybe later down the line when the name is a household name, but as of now, I'm just building my thing. Okay. So you, as you've been doing your thing, as you're saying, you've done a lot of stuff. You've been with some big companies. You've been with some medium-sized companies. You've been some, with some big br- name brands. Yeah. How did you... How did this door get there? I mean, the door was there. Did you beat it down? Did somebody help you with the door? How, how did this work out for you? So it's kind of a long and boring question, but I'm trying to make it as interesting <laughs> as, as I can. Well, two things happen. One, I realized that trajectory isn't a straight line. I think that's mm-hmm. very important. I think a lot of us, because school is so linear, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, we think, oh, job, 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 and I'm awesome. The end. <laughs> uh, and, and so go, going back to grad school, so I went to film school out here in California. That's why I got mm-hmm. stuck here in this uh, weird town of broken dreams and bomb dreams. <laughs> but but uh, my first job, really, like first serious job was at Fox. And I thought I was going to be a Fox man for life. I was going to be a salary man. Uh, they let me go on one fateful Thursday and I had a crisis of conscience. What do I do? And Mm -hmm. doing that and having the background of video optimization and content clipping and all that stuff, said, okay, I'm going to go into writing books and novels. Did that as well. I got into uh, more of the stand-up comedy. That's basically writing humor for yourself. And that doing performing live became the MC job. And MC led to DJing. And DJing and MC led to motivational speaking and keynote speaking. So, like, everything builds on something else. So it's good to have a guide of what you think the big goal is. But, you know, leave yourself open to, hey, you want to try, like this year, during the pandemic, I'm on my butt, can't go outside. And someone goes, hey, man, we have this video game tournament. Do you want to cast it or commentate on it? I go, sure. It's one of my favorite games to play. It's called Rocket League. And I've been a Rocket League cast over the past 10 months. And I'm in demand there, too. So <laughs> it's just keeping it open, for sure. So, so you're keeping everything open, then. So, I mean, if you're even going as far as that now, or do you put that on your own channel and cast it out that way? So that way it's kind of like a repeater? Well, it's kind of funny because I, when I first started, I was like, well, I don't want to have that part of the Flobo brand because not good. <laughs> what if I suck? I'm going to have a brand new name. It's going to be a different personality. It's going to be called Novanta, right? It's, <laughs> my name is Novanta. It's, it's Italian for 90 because it's a car soccer game if you haven't okay. played it. So mm-hmm. I figured 90 minutes in a soccer game, top 90 of a net, 90. Novanta. But what mm-hmm. happens is someone Googles you and it becomes completely moot. <laughs> they go, hey, Blobo, what are you doing? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so, so it's a separate channel, Novanta RL on Twitter. But like, mm-hmm. it's my face. I link to my other social media. It's a, don't do that. Oh, don't have Very, very well hidden, it sounds like yeah, then, for not, sure. Not even. Well, I, well, I mean, it's funny that you say that because that was a, a, that was a product that was heavily marketed on WWE that you referenced earlier. That's so. how I became a fan, so, actually. Oh, okay. Very, yeah, very interesting. So, so the third bir- they're based in San Diego, and their third birthday is uh, they celebrated at Peco Park, which is a beautiful ballpark uh, during Comic Con. And they had a pre man. Becky Lynch and Xavier Woods there for a signing. So I go oh, there nice. to get my autograph. And on the Jumbotron is this crazy bonkers game. And they said, hey, look, thanks for coming out. Use this code. You can download a SmackDown banner. And I was hooked. And that was three years ago. <laughs> nice. So you mentioned Xavier Wood and Becky Lynch. I'm going to jump onto Xavier Wood for just one moment. Yeah. The rebirth of G4 TV. You know what? It was a long time coming. And it was it was a weird thing because towards the end of the first one, I was like, you, you need to go. You need to go. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, but, but the whole the whole appetite has changed. I mean, esports are now not only legitimate because they kind of always were, but they're being more accepted. We had ESPN play it because they had nothing to play over the summer. <laughs> There's people looking for organizations. Guys are and gals are investing in teams. And so, yeah, it's, now it's time more than any to get back into that culture. I was a classic nerd. And by that, I meant I got beat up for being a nerd. So... <laughs> I am a veteran of a long forgotten war. So all that dirt stuff, sure, bring it on. So do you think that the re I guess the the coming back or the reincarnation of G4 TV has a lot to do with Twitch? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I see back when Twitch was just in TV. I used to mm-hmm. there and old days, like, old days. Yeah, yeah old, old school, brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I was sitting there and I go, this is hard to describe. But fascinating. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's like a deep tissue massage. It should <laughs> hurt, but it's great. And so right. to see that blow up and to see even people, even before the pandemic, try to find ways to monetize it and they have their own channels, whether it's video games or talk shows. My Twitch channel is mostly talk shows. I mean, the idea that like, it's a whole community of people that support people with bits and they, they raid others. It's like this crazy thing. And yeah, you can poo-poo the fact that a big corporate overload owns it, but what 
company doing stuff now is not owned by somebody <laughs> with a bunch of cash. And so Twitch is being there, and I can see G4 seeing that and going, let's get back into it. Well, I don't – with the company that owns it being, of course, Amazon, you kind of have to dig just a tad to be able to find it. It's not like they – they promote, I mean, unless you, you're they're running ads and you kind of see some Amazon stuff related there, but I don't really think it's that bad. I think it's a really good service for what it offers because you can find a little bit of everything and then some, at least yeah. on there. <laughs> I, I, I understand the ideas of, of, of giant companies and monopolies, but I mean, it's so convenient, bro. <laughs> I know there's some people who are kind of like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll do XYZ.TV because it's different, but I'm just saying, <laughs> mm-hmm. what, one button and things come to my house. I don't even, things I don't even need. You know what I mean? Amazon is everywhere. They, the cloud services are everywhere. They're just going to be part of our life. That's it. They're air. That's it. So how, how was your love for Mixer? Did you care for it? Did you not care for it? How was the general feeling? So I was an Xbox guy. I understand okay. that, that for a long time, PlayStation got smart and they had the stronger hardware for a long time. So that community is pretty much ingrained. And even now in this generation, the Series X is a, it's a superior machine, but no one wants to buy it. So <laughs> Mixer, Mixer was fine. It was one touch. It was a button. It was, it was great. Uh, but I realized it was a problem in describing what it was without describing the competition. Oh, it's like Twitch, but and that's uh, that's dead in the water. No one's ever like an Oreo is a Hydrox, but no, they know what an Oreo is. So I knew it was a dying platform. It's only a matter of time. Well, I mean, and then of course with F- with Facebook acquiring it now, with oh. it being, I think it's FB.GG or something along those lines. I haven't I, been on it since. Right. I, I get it. I, I feel like Facebook needs to spin off some of these apps, man. Like, it's just too cluttered. Like, I'm going to buy some used tires, watch a video game, and find a date on the same platform? This is weird. This is totally weird. Oh, man. So let me jump back just a hair because you did say something earlier about how you are a motivational speaker now as long as well as a comedian. So do you think that by actually doing part of your comedy and you get to go practice or you practice your, your comedy speeches – this is kind of helps your motivational speeches because you kind of almost have to test the waters with some of this stuff. Do you kind of feel that it's helped it out? Oh, absolutely. I think it's for the motivational speaker, it's part comedy, part material and understanding structure and jokes. And you have to have a point, I guess you can't ramble on forever because people will tune out. <laughs> uh, but, but also like the Instagram, social media, like I am so done with fast food, like captions, like believe in yourself. Like, what does that mean when the bills are due? <laughs> I, mean, I still believe have that you're going to pay for it. Believe. I don't know how much believe it. Right. Exactly. Don't let no one tell you nothing. It's like, okay, <laughs> whatever. And so I think a lot of that comes with the, the ground level stuff. So the motivations I do are more about like pushing that extra to do list thing, the small steps. Um, for me personally, my angle. I don't want to say angle because that's not it's, it's Yeah, don't say gimmick either. That's, an, that's yeah, another matter. Yeah, my gimmick is that, well, my history is that I used to weigh uh, 375 pounds. And, and okay. so my, my motivation comes from that, about taking that one step, taking the the taking the smaller cheeseburger. You know what I mean? So uh-huh. understanding it's, it's a small thing. So to keep it real, those are the, those are the personalities you got to, how people connect with you, back to my Donald Trump point, back to my <laughs> wrestling point. Uh, but, but yeah, the moment you go on stage, you're like, what you need to do is don't care what people think. It's like, <laughs> we've heard it from everyone <laughs> on the oh. planet. What are you giving me? <laughs> you know, when I hear stuff like that, I think automatically to Brewster's Million with Richard Pryor, very, very oh, old wow. movie in regards yeah. of when, when he would say, don't vote for me. <laughs> don't believe anything they're saying. And then everybody ended up voting for him. Right. But it's Here's a lot. It's, it, it, it seems like a lot of that angle, if you really think about it to an extent, because we kind of get a lot of the stuff same repackaged. And it's very different to find somebody who says, no, I, I don't want you to tell you something that applies to nothing. True. So, the, the, and you've done things that have changed for you. So as you've done that, is that why you look at it differently than most? Well, there's also that formula of what they call relatability. Everybody wants to be more relatable than anything else. And so there's that odd balance of bragging about what you've done, but trying to be vulnerable. So what you'll see a lot of times on social media, someone like in a three-piece suit hanging in front of a car, be like, LOL, forgot my wife's anniversary. It's like, <laughs> oh, okay, well, we'll get where you're doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh-huh. But like, But like, even though I won't say it's a formula that applies to me, I want to make sure that this is actually things I've lived through. I think that the nugget of reality is what matters. And so the moment I'm talking about, you know, don't you just hate it when you have to refuel your jet in Dubai? You'll know that it's not me <laughs> at all. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, make sure it's oh. legitimate. Well, that, that's funny because that reminds me of the marketing that they did for the Cadillac ELR. Now, this is a car that is the identical to the Chevy Bolt, except that it has some fancier trims. Mm-hmm. And it, they made it sound that it was supposed to be for the elite personnel in regards of what they were doing. The car was $90,000 when you can get a Chevy Bolt for thirty, And all it was was the exact same base with 
the Cadillac brand on there. So it almost sounds like that's some of the portions that you're looking at in regards of, I'm not going to be the guy. I mean, I would love to be the guy that has a a jet, but I I know that I wouldn't waste that kind of money. But that's how you're looking at it, right? You are a man after my own heart. This is what I do because I'm a nerd. I like to look (laughs) at at corporate branding and ownership and stuff like that. So, and the different brand and then like, especially when it comes to like cars. I'm a Mercury guy. I like Mercury design. I thought it was superior, but you couldn't convince me it was nothing more than expensive Ford. <laughs> but, but that's what I'm saying. Like, I remember that. Or remember the Aston Martin Signet? Remember that car? <laughs> Basically, it was like a car that Aston Martin had to make to make sure the fleet was under the uh, EPA or the equivalent of the European EPA, like gas per mileage. And it was like a, a Fiat rebadged. Re-bad, <laughs> but it was like, again, like $90,000 for this Aston Martin Signet. He was like, who wants to drive a Fiat? But, but, but you're saying, yeah, there is a there is a nugget of what you are at the core and you can stretch beyond that. Like I can wear a suit, I can wear a t-shirt and jeans, for example. But the moment I'm wearing a top hat and tails, you know something's up. And I'm just a kid from Brooklyn. My parents are still out there. Uh, my neighborhood knows me uh, from, from day one. But the moment you stray from that, people go, okay, I'm off board. Yeah, so the moment you get out of the jeans and T-shirt, people might have some questions then. I mean, yeah, they'll always have questions. I'm walking around town naked. <laughs> They're in our show, right? This is cool. <laughs> you can say whatever you want. does hey, not matter. We, way, we, do, we do whatever you want to do. So as you've been in California over the last year yeah. during the pandemic, mm-hmm. so some news was released today that California ranks as number 28 yes. with the actual most cases that are out there. So about 9,000 to, to every 100,000 people. So they've taken lockdown, extreme, closed everything down. Now I'm going to give you the side of the planet that I'm on, mm-hmm. which the numbers are almost identical, 9,000 to every 100,000. And we're ranked number 27. Yeah. So what, what do you think? What do you think there in regards to the two different options that they've went about? I, I Your opinion, I, of course, of course, uh, is one they, opinion question. I didn't really know per amounts, but I knew full number of population over infections versus recovery versus death. And it was like Florida and California was just so similar. I mean, like if you look at the data, they're, they're kind of like neck and neck. But what I have noticed, depending on what side of the aisle you reside on, there is a bit of a propaganda thing. Yeah. You know, oh, you know, that crazy crackpot new some bill businesses are crippled. We kind of are, but they're terrible out there. And I'm like, well, how is Florida even better? Now, it gets weird. Uh, for those of you who don't know my stand-up, I grew up in a two-party household. Uh, my mom is very progressive. My dad is actually a registered Republican. And so those kind of battles happen all the time in my household. But I'm like, we're not getting any better. Like, this virus doesn't stop and go, whoa, Florida, we're done. You know what I mean? Because if it had an option to, it wouldn't even enter. It's a weird state. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. This is something we all have to band together and get around with. But gyms are opening today. Uh, indoor dining is opening today uh, as of March 15th. And so maybe we're on on that or flattening the curve or whatever. But I knew for months ago, like this infection rate was pretty much even Stevens across the board. So have you thought about doing what a lot of Californians are doing and running off to Texas, becoming the, te- the California of Texas or Texas of California, however you want to take a look at it? Oh, Texas doesn't want them. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. it, it's a weird vibe because, because like actual Californians are here and they're nice mm-hmm. people and they're great people, but it's just people like us transplant. We ruin it for everybody. Uh, I'm from New York. I go back and I'm like These tourists. And I've mm-hmm. lived there for so long. And, and so, yeah, you can go to Texas all you want. I've been to Austin, beautiful city. But the one thing you notice is that there are Texans, there are transplants to Austin, and then there's California transplants in Austin. There's almost like a third city in that city. And so mm-hmm. I'd rather not. Nope, nope, nope. Well, I, remember, I, remember, I remember being in Texas because I grew up in Texas for many, many years. Oh. And I remember that people said for a long period of time that Austin would be the next Hollywood. This was back like in 96. I mm-hmm. mean, we're in 21 right now, and I still think they're still having the same conversation. Things in, but Austin has changed from what it what it was. But if you go to any other city in Texas, it's still Texas. I mean, it's not it's not progressive. It's not... Nothing. I mean, that sounds wrong because I'm kind of putting a blanket statement there, but right. it's not as advanced as Austin, depending if you look at as Austin as advanced. I mean, their their motto is keep Austin weird. This is The Jay Allen Show. Hey, have you ever wanted to hear what's going on around in the world of safety and you're not able to do so? Have you ever wanted to take a listen to what exactly is going around in the world of safety? What if we called that thing around the safety body? And we told you month over month, What is happening in the mix? Would you care to know what would it be worth to you? 
Now, here's the fun part. Besides that you can find out exactly what's going on inside of the world of safety, there's also other information available there. Stuff that you can start using as early as today. How about you give us a look? Go to our website, safetyfmplus.com. That's safetyfmplus.com to find out what exactly is going on inside of the world of safety, around the world of safety, and inside of the world of safety. And don't forget to tell them that Jay Allen sent you. I'll see you on the other side. Make sure to join the revolution. And we are back on the Jay Allen Show on Safety FM. Right. The, the, almost like Portland, right? No, you're right. <laughs> Texas has this kind of like city-state thing going. You know, you don't mess with Texas. No one ever says, don't mess with Oklahoma, please. No, no one says that. <laughs> and, and, I, and I knew that going in because because it's, it's so wide. It's so massive. Every stereotype about Texas is true, what I've seen. When I was a kid, my mom did Mary Kay. And so every mm-hmm. year she would go to Dallas. And there were cowboy hats on one side. There were businessmen on the other side. It, it was almost everything in this giant, like, uh, I guess, hyper-realistic Southern kind of vibe. And I, I respect that. I've been to Dallas a couple of times. I loved it. been to Dallas. I haven't been to Houston. Um, it's an it's a old entity unto itself. But I can tell you to this day, for a lot of people living in Los Angeles, in this Los Angeles area, the, the, the branding of Austin is still appealing. Hey, South by Southwest. Uh, hey, mm-hmm. Rob Rodriguez was there. It's going to be better in Austin, Texas. <laughs> and well, I've seen some of the housing situations. It's not that better because there's an influx of people uh, coming in. There's actually a housing deficit in Austin. In fact, now it's like, so San Antonio. <laughs> <laughs> weird migration pattern that we have out here. <laughs> well, I mean, he, I mean, Houston was popular for a period of time. And I could tell people at one particular point, you could close your eyes in Houston and say, open them, and I tell people they're in Florida, and they would believe it because of how some of the areas were laid out. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it becomes interesting on how transplants actually occur because there was a lot of people trying to escape from California because of the close down. Why did you opt not to do it? Why did you decide to stay there, especially being from New York, transferring to actual California? Yeah. So, I mean, and then now your business has entirely changed. So why did you decide to stay there when you could do it from anywhere? I think the big bad thing in the room is a virus. Like, there's no, there's not going to be no walls. There's going to be no, like, barriers for it. Like, yeah, things would be cheaper, but I have to up my entire life. I am a small business owner in that regard. You know, I my, my main source of income is I DJ weddings in the California. Mm-hmm. So to p- turn that down, to move somewhere else, to set that up, would to me would not be worth it. I've been here and since 2007 and in entertainment industry. And so for a lot of times it felt like not necessarily living in California, dude, but, <laughs> but, but leaving home to go to the old steel mill to work. And so there's years where I have it, but like anything else would be the prodigal son. So my dad will call me and go, Hey man, Fox news or one American news or Newsmax says mm-hmm. everyone's leaving California to go to Texas. And I'll go, well, if I do that, then, to me, it'd be a failure, right? Mm-hmm. I have some sort of realism. And by realism, I mean like there's a whole lot of negativity with one shard of optimism. Mm-hmm. That's something will c- turn around and that either more work will, work will come or I'll get more established here where I wouldn't have to move. But yeah, the thought was there, man. It, it really was, <laughs> especially in the summer when there was no weddings to go to and there was no talk of a second stimulus check. <laughs> and we're no. out there eating things out of cans going, oh, this is real, bro. <laughs> it's like, is it college all over again? I mean, <laughs> yeah. it felt like that at certain points. <laughs> Take that mop. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were starting to see everything change and all of a sudden people were either canceling or rebooking, were they booking for a year out or were they going ahead and just getting married without any kind of ceremony? What were you seeing at the time? Well, thankfully for me, a lot of them was just postponed because whether or not you believe what they're saying on the news, it just didn't seem like 2022 click. It was like <laughs> three weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. And that was great. So my 2020 wasn't as bad as most, but like had is had 2020's rate continued on without a vaccine. This I will feel a lot more because there'd be no end in sight kind of a thing. And I only had one cancellation and it was early enough to be like, yeah, take the money. I don't want to argue or go to court over it. Just do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but that was kind of scary because you didn't really know. Um, everything I did was in live entertainment. We're talking even my my um, cash grab PA job at the local venue downtown where I got the green M&Ms for bands between gigs. I mean, that was the last ones to come back. So I had put all my eggs in this basket going, 
oh my gosh, <laughs> the <laughs> one thing I didn't foresee coming was a global pandemic that happens <laughs> once a century has occurred <laughs> right. in my peak earning years. <laughs> that oh, no. damn Spanish flu, I should have known better about <laughs> yeah. it. Patterns, bro, patterns. So as you're, as you're looking across, do you think that because of the, how you diversified across the board, you've been able to be successful or at least maintain during this whole thing? Is that how you look at it? Yeah, now more than ever. I, 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 I feel like to me it was DJing events, wedding events, unofficiating events. That was like my main thing. And and after that, even now, there's a podcasting thing, there's the video game casting thing. I close the efficient business. So being able to look back at yourself as a business, like everyone wants to be a CEO, but nobody wants to close down apartments. <laughs> nobody <laughs> wants to fire people or put yourself to work earlier. And so doing that helped me out a bit and to help diversify what I can do. So I sit in this chair to perhaps maybe too many hours a day, <laughs> but, but, but to able to do so many different aspects and to potentially put the seeds down to earn, that's what you need to do, especially now more than ever, where because we're at home all the time, there really is less incentive to go out. Movie theaters have a Herculean task of telling me now in 2021 that coming back to a theater, besides nostalgia, is worth doing it. You know, right. we've had gourmet popcorn we have our surround system and home theaters. <laughs> Tell me a reason why I should do it. 5D, maybe? I have no idea. I mean, uh, with HBO Max doing what they have pulled out of out of their little rabbit hat, all of a sudden, that is just one of those magic tricks that I think it's going to be difficult. I mean, I think it hurt the industry, let's be number one. And then number two, I think it's going to be interesting because I don't see how other streaming platforms are not going to do the exact same thing. Yeah, it did, I get you. There's, there's an actual thing between... Uh, the experience, oh man, I think beats uh, theater experience, but that can evaporate with time. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Kids don't today don't know what a dial up tone is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like I can imagine someone's like, well, we kept making Nickelodeon machines because the feeling, bro. I'm just cranking well, I, this video clip. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, welcome to AOL. No, but they didn't say AOL. It's like, you've got mail. Yeah, you've got mail. <laughs> I have mail. Yes. And then I remember when you could change the name, that was such a big deal. So I'm glad that you were able to diversify and able to still maintain and do the things is there one the thing that you enjoy doing more than the other and i know that's almost asking which one's your favorite child but yeah. you have all, to ask the question remember from time to time <laughs> uh, the, the top story is i am fulfilled now more than before because before the pandemic the, the goal was okay flobito i call myself that <laughs> you've done things in la you gotta try putting your, your act in the road to see if it's good and all kinds of things so like i was so bummed because i had gigs in alaska and gigs in, in tokyo lined up i was gonna go ahead and oh, do wow. this um, but then it was like, ah, screw you, bro. Um, so being able to do different things, now I have more options. And I can tell you the podcasting things I love. The, the video game casting is a thrill. Like if someone told me you can only do this for free, I'd be like, cool. You know what I mean? It's so much fun. But definitely the podcasting. I have uh, six shows currently. Being able to like change gears for each one of them and have a structure for one of them and bring guests for those. And I almost have this virtual party. That to me is like what I like to do. If I get to be doing that and be able to feed myself out of cans and buy furniture, I don't have to build myself (laughs) that I want. (laughs) So you are acknowledging some similarities here. Podcast, sports announcer, comedian. I think I know of some other guy that was pretty pop or is really popular now, has probably the number one podcast on the planet that does all those three things. Haven't heard of him. <laughs> no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> me either, me either. That, it, guys, but... <laughs> that damn Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> it's not me to a dude. <laughs> no, but it's it, it, it's interesting in regards to, if you kind of look years back, I don't know if, if you watched a lot of MTV when you were younger, but Adam Curry was the first one that I ever heard talk about podcasting. And I was like, I have no idea what the hell that is. Yeah. And that was back late nineties, late nineties when he was talking about it. And look where this is at now. Well, what do, you, th- what do you think? I didn't know. Well, I didn't have camera growing up until I was 17. Yeah. So, so my MTV experience is limited, but back in my day, <laughs> they used to have... play music videos a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and Carson Daly was there. Uh, well, Kurt Lord was there first, but yes. uh, it, it was uh, understanding what a podcast was. Because an iPod is something that almost no one has anymore because music right. has become all commoditized. But I remember when I was a, a kid or was a teenager, there was a thing called internet radio. You, you would license a station and you would go on for me like 30 minutes a week with my little compact Presario sticky mic. <laughs> but it was live. There was no recording. There was uh-huh. no way to see. You had to like know where to go. They and still have that now. <laughs> so weird. Because even then you're like, I feel like such a dweeb doing this. Uh, but yeah, I remember the, the podcast boom. I remember the podcast collapse. 
I remember the cereal having the podcast thing too. And now I got my, my, my oldest podcast is old, but like the one that's still current, my oldest current podcast is about two years. But since that two years, I've seen everyone do it. And it's like, there are more podcasts out there than there are human beings in the United States, but we're going to keep on making podcasts for the sake of it. It is here to stay. And it's cool to see because now people that didn't have a voice have one, whether or not they have downloads or something completely different. But <laughs> well, that's voice. a whole, that's, that's a whole other story. Right. So as you look at it and you did the old school microphone going to the live portion, how did you enjoy the radio aspect of it when you were doing it? Radio was one of those things that I, I thought that had I known, but had radio was healthy back then, I probably would have done that. I went to college in 99, oh, sorry, 2003, excuse me. And even then I was like, this seems like it's pretty much, it's all MP3s, man. <laughs> What's the point of radio? Napster, give me some <laughs> yeah, Napster. Give me some live. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, so even then, so I took radio classes and I love doing it. I love having that voice and being the host aspect of it. The, I guess I'm a people pleaser in that way. But I, even then, I knew that it was kind of a, a slim breed. In fact, a friend of mine was in my class, went the radio route, worked for a giant company. Can't name it, but you know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, There's only one giant radio company. So, <laughs> Oh, my heart's hurting. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's odd. Um, but then one day they walked in and go, you know what? We got this algorithm and a host in Denmark. Peace. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so she has to start find, find work. And it's a very specialized craft. And there's really not much of a choice but podcasting now or doing um, live hosts in bars and stuff around town. And so right. again, I think I dodged a bullet there. But 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 yeah, going back there, I love radio. I love being able to say, these are the same songs, and, but I'm going to give you the experience. There's content, <laughs> and people pay for the experience. There's a billion to one wrestling review shows, but people are buying into, whether by their eyes or, or buying merch, because they want to see what my take is or what your take right. is or or what have you. Like I saw your video and I'm like, man, he sounds smooth, not microphone. <laughs> Let me be on matchmaker <laughs> and see if I can be a guest. And so that's that's the difference. People are, are buying the interpretations. So yes, like more Chevy Bolt, less cat. <laughs> so as you looked at this whole thing and then you you looked at the radio, you looked at the podcast and you decided to go down the podcasting, you do acknowledge that there's tons of podcasts out there. I think during the pandemic there has more that have come about. Do you think with having your radio experience and now going into podcasting, this assists you in actually retaining your audience? Yes. Uh, oh, man, 101 ways. I mentioned this before, but having a structure does help. <clears throat> Excuse me. Having a structure does help and having segments help and trying mm-hmm. to run to a time. There's so many podcasts that are just like, well, we just talk about stuff. And I look uh-huh. at descriptions now because you got to look at the competition, right? And it's like... <laughs> Uh, the extreme unique podcast three friends talk about pop culture and you're like well who the hell are you guys and why should i care unless you're famous that's not gonna work so for me my wrestling show the hook i guess the the gimmick here is that i cover nxt uk which is a british wrestling brand that no one covers and we do it in a comedic sense so that's why i get most of my new fans my new fans are hey someone's covering this obscure show i love and i stayed because of this my late night talk show, tons of that. But hey, it happens at 10 o'clock Pacific. You have these unique games and you bring people who are famous and not famous in a mix. Mm-hmm. I'm in that. So yeah, it's kind of discouraging. When you look at your downloads, you're like, I gave you my blood, sweat, and tears. And that's all I get. But It was one o'clock in the morning Eastern time. <laughs> you know what I'm doing here? <laughs> you know no, I'm but saying? I have to tell you that segment that you do at the towards the end of the show where you do the seven questions, I think oh. it's awesome. And oh, then yeah. you actually, Thank you. and then you, then you turn around and you actually give the money to charity or the charity that they're referencing to. I think that that's great. Can't I think afford to do it every week, but what do I do? <laughs> 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 Whatever, no. But I think I think it's great when you do it. Now, here's the thing: you do talk about NXT UK. Um, I will tell you, I'm probably legitimately like 25 minutes from the performance center, where from where I'm actually located here. Dang. Not the U, not the UK one, of course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> As you take a look, and I'm going to mention, and I'm sorry for the people that don't love it, but I love this stuff. Yeah. For the people that that don't know about professional wrestling, there's, we'll say three organizations, that we'll say three main, well, we can say two main, one kind of third that's been around for some time. Sure. What's the love that you have? Which, what, do you, what do you like about Impact? What do you like about AEW? What do you like? Mm-hmm. What, 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 well, I don't know. Do you want to put Impact as third or do you want to put um, Ring of Honor? I, Depending I, on how you want to take a look at it. I'll say and then what, just, just on the oh. fact they've been on TV for that long. <clears throat> okay. 
And of course, I don't have to mention WWE, but I, I will reference them because it, it kind of falls into a little bit of everything. Yeah, because Amazon you have to think about Raw. SmackDown, you have to think about SmackDown, you have to think about Raw, you have to think about NXT and NXT UK. Uh, we won't go into Evolve and all that other stuff because then we can just cause all kinds of confusion. Well, they're so, be so, so what do you think? Too, so yeah. <laughs> yeah so, uh, well, it's, it's okay. Bias out the way. I actually co-host another show on my partner's Jack Farmer's show called Leader of the Week. It covers AEW. So I have to watch it. Um, mm-hmm. It To me, AEW, AEW is AAA ball. But I don't mean that disparagingly. You have a little flame that you're a WWE homer because this is a mm-hmm. manufactured, like, East Coast, West Coast beef. <laughs> Blood grit beef about it. Um, what AEW does is fantastically well. Uh, they have a lot of, in ways, better in-ring action. But I'm a character guy. Character first. The wrestling is, for me, second. And the storyline's third. And for mm-hmm. me, a lot of the characters are kind of are like on loan. This guy is great because he was great in Japan. This mm-hmm. guy is great because he was great in the independent circuit. And so if you don't know this person's previous five-year career, there are, as a fan-centric wrestling organization they want to be, almost inaccessible to tell me why I should care about this guy now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. The former champion, John Moxley, is dope, but I know him as formerly Dean Ambrose. Kenny right. Omega is one of the most fan gifted wrestlers on the planet. But if you don't in watch Japan. in Japan, <laughs> but if you don't watch in Japan because it's at four o'clock in the morning here in the, in the West Coast, you're not going to know. And you have to go and look through tapes or old videos. So a lot of times I feel they kind of forget that. And the women's division, I won't even mention. So I watch AEW because I'm a fan of the sport. But to me, it's pure entertainment value. WWE sometimes beats you over the head of why you care for people. <laughs> but it helps you because you can drop off a couple weeks and go, oh, yeah, it's that guy, you know, and an impact. As a small business owner DIY, I like the fact they're still hanging out, still hanging right. tough, giving wrestlers a third option, especially when WWE let go 40 uh, staff members during the pandemic. <laughs> Which is the, almost the whole roster of Impact currently. <laughs> right, yeah, that's another problem. You're like, oh, them again, great. But uh-huh. I, I watch them the least. I'll tune in every six weeks or so. They had an event last weekend, uh, Sacrifice. Checked it out. It was great. Skimmed it. Amazing. Um, but yeah, I'm a WWE guy in that way because I think character matters. When I see Cesaro swing someone half his size or double his size, I go, that guy is strong. He showed me he's strong. Great. <laughs> Not like but that's a, such a move from the 60s, which is amazing that he pulls it off today and it's like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, a little bit of, like Bruno Mars, a little bit of old school, a little bit of new. That's all I want. That's all I want. Right. <laughs> so. As, as you reference this and you talk about WWE and how you like them better out of all three, which understandably so, what's your general feelings about them moving to Peacock? So I I get it. You know, sometimes you got to no, yeah, it. Money, money makes sense. Money makes sense. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, having those, uh, those uh, what do you call those, infomercial podcasts <laughs> where you're like, wow, tell me more about your thing. I, I, I totally get it. It's not selling out if you care about it. Um, <laughs> But as a as a WWE Network subscriber, I was like, oh man, I don't necessarily care. I mean, I'm a soccer fan, so it's fine to get Premier League, fine. But like, I don't care about the office. It's going to be weird to be like, get WWE on this other. Th-. It does seem optically like a step backwards. It does mm-hmm. seem like we had our own platform, but we're understanding we're not growing this platform. It's over there. I still have not figured out. I've asked what that means for NXT UK. Is it still airing at the same time? Is it going to be mm-hmm. live? No one's got back to me. A lot of confusion there. But I actually bought it because I get to write it off now as a journalist. <laughs> so <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, the other the other portion you have to look at, too, is that there's some features that are not there currently. Like, you can't rewind something that's live on Peacock currently. Right. So how, how does that going to work for pay-per-views as it does right now on, on the network? Then the other portion to take a look at, too, is based on information from WWE is that not all 17,000 hours worth of content right. are going to be available on day one. That's not going to take place until around SummerSlam from what they're saying. So that's August at the late August is normally the way that it works for the people that don't know. And then the other portion to reference real quick is that it has to be premium tier Peacock. It's not entry level Peacock mm-hmm. that you have WWE access, yeah, but it's well, the same price point. Yeah. It's the same price point. <laughs> that, that to me is, it's not a friction point, but for some people it can be, but that definitely it seems to deal with a reverse engineer. It was like, we want to be on this platform that is a big event in April. What could we do to make it happen? Well, we could do this content later. Let's do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? and, and so it'd be frustrating as far as, and you're going to love this. So as far as uh, not rewinding, on Wednesday nights, because my schedules are pretty tight between Wednesday and Thursday, and I have the NXT show, and I'm on the AEW show, I have four screens. I have AEW on one. I have NXT Prime on another. I have my phone doing tweets, and I have my tablet doing notes. So it's, it's really like minority report. <laughs> And mind you, for those of you who can't see me, I'm in my mid-30s. This is what I do every Wednesday night in my mid-30s. I'm trying to understand, like, okay. So I don't necessarily 
matter to have that rewind in live, but I can see how that could be totally a pain point. Like, whoa, what was that? I, they didn't even do a replay. It, it sucks. You're, like, you're getting less features now, but to me, it doesn't really matter. So what do you think will end up happening with this? Here's another question. When it comes to USA Network, currently on the WWE Network, it's a month delay before you actually get a replay of the actual current product. Do you think with it now being on NBC, Universal, which is part of USA, do you think you'll get a, a real play in real time within 24 hours? Or do you think that that's still be a delayed a month? Opinion question, of course. So, so what I've read that they're going to keep the same terms and that Raw and SmackDown is 30 days delay. No, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> For that reason, I'm out. Um, but NXT, once NXT moved to USA, they have a 24-hour delay. So I guess in that way, it's not so bad. But whatever, man. Like, I know Fox wants their, 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 their maximum value. They're, they're a live right. plus seven organization. Um, I watch them all the time, but it does suck when you have the network and you're like, oh, wait, I can't, I can't show my buddy what happened 10 days ago. Is that weird right. like gap, like between day eight and day 29, you're just like, remember that thing that happened with Big E and Sami Zayn? Like, you don't really know how to bring it up. So most current or current WWE superstar, as they refer to their wrestlers, that's underrated in your point of view. Well, well, Cesaro's always my guy, but he's finally getting some shine. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do think Balor's work has finally come around. I've been a big Sheamus guy. I think a lot of people don't think how what it means to be a powerhouse in the, having the business change of what that means for so long. Mm -hmm. um, and when MVP came back over Edge, I was a huge pop for MVP. I was never an Edge fan growing up, so I was like, Edge, but every person's back. But I <laughs> you mean Adam right, Copeland. Yo. You didn't like Adam Copeland. Everybody loves Edge. No, I'm joking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, yeah. I was never – I was thought a Christian Cage, mm -hmm. now, I guess, was, yeah. my, was my guy. And I was a Dudley's team fan oh, in, yes. that, in that triangle feud with the Hardys. But, yeah, when MVP came back, I knew MVP going back – to that period in wrestling. For those who don't know, you know, we all knew wrestling was predetermined, but mm -hmm. MVP as a character, Montel Vontavious Porter is what it stands for. They treated him like he was a football player. They had a signing right. vignette. It came out in an inflatable tunnel. He had Silk the Shocker on his theme song, and that was a prototype character because now, more than ever, when these giant organizations are trying to like group it MMA wrestling and call them combat sports and boxing, everyone's treated as if they're a superstar signing. That character was way before his time. And so finally in 2020, he's getting his flowers, but I was like beating that drum. I was a Bailey fan day one, which was miserable for a long time. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have like so much of a merch, man. And she's so much more important to what wrestling is. And you'll know, I'm not sure what your, who your audience is, but like representation matters. Bailey was, <laughs> Bailey is Latina, but she never had to be a spicy Latina. No one right. ever had to call her mamacita. You know, she mm -hmm. just wanted to hug people at first. And now right. she just wants to beat people up, which is great. Right. <laughs> and so, no, but, I'll yeah. tell you, I took, I took my, my oldest daughter to a W to a NXT event. That was when they were still at the, at the armory before they went to, to the Capitol center. Um, and she gave my daughter one of the, one of the hair bands that she was wearing. And my daughter, all of a sudden, since then, Bailey fan for life, loves her villain, good, bad, different, loves her. She's a hugger, has the shirt several times over, but still loves her to this day. Yeah. So I would as love you to meet Bailey because I, I would meet because I know because again I didn't like Bret Hart either because as a mm -hmm. kid I'm like hey, he's just getting kids to like him like giving away the glass. <laughs> so I told you, there, there's probably some truth to that. <laughs> so as as you take a look at this whole this whole thing on how wrestling goes, and we we've spoken a little bit about characters. When you, when you take a look at some of the people that have come about, and we can talk WCW, ECW, AWA, NWA, whatever you want to talk about, what character comes to mind that sticks out that had probably the most influences just that you took the deep dive into to wanting to pursue and really start talking about wrestling? Like like the character or just like the, the yep. ability? The, well, it could be either. It could be the character or the ability or even both. Yeah, well, when it comes to the character, it has to be The Rock. And I know The Rock seems a very, like, standard answer. But, you know, as me, as a... As a I'm laughing at this. As a pimply fat kid with an afro, <laughs> he was walking confidence. And I'm talking like 98 when he had like the mm -hmm. loud shirts and the gold chain and the huge meaty pecs. I was like, well, this is what this is what men look like? Cool. You know, to mm -hmm. me, that was so aspirational. And I remember asking my mom for the, get, to get the most loudest Hawaiian shirts. I would walk around with the cheesy drugstore sunglasses being, you know, trying to do the eyebrow and 
that was so empowering <laughs> to see because there weren't many there weren't many brown skin heroes on television. I mean, this is the days right. of like Law and Order where everyone who was brown was like a criminal. Like, right. So to see someone actually win or or if he didn't win, like got back with the rock trip <laughs> to me, that was hilarious. <laughs> but um, as growing up, I always liked D'Lo Brown. D'Lo Brown to me was the chunky kid who can be a powerhouse, who can run, who can jump off the top rope. Who can say get your monkey ass up? And I still have his action figure mm-hmm. to this day uh, because of how influential that was. And, and I look at when you have people and their expectations of you, have it, own the expectations, realize it, and then just go slightly left. Don't go totally crazy, but go slightly left. This is why when I do karaoke today, I'll do Allison Change, Man in the Box, Tommy Dreamer's mm-hmm. theme. If you want to be ECW about it, because nobody expects me to do it. I got uh-huh. a kid from Brooklyn, but like, oh. I'm the mer- like it's like it's totally. Cr- I'll do like Kryptonite three doors down. And there's ladies in nice. the audience. You know what I mean? Like because you see an expectation, turn mm-hmm. slightly, and that's how you get people to say, "Hey, look, who's this guy? What's he doing? How they can relate to you um, authentically." You mentioned D'Lo Brown. I I swear that guy has no neck bone. The way that he moves his head, I don't even know how the hell he pulls that off. That is one move that I'm just like, wow, always amazed about. When you take a look at the now at the female at the, the female wrestlers, and you're taking a look. Who sticks out to you? Like who comes to mind when you hear division? And I'm talking WWE because the other organization really doesn't have much. I mean, they're trying, but they don't have much of one current. Like to, to AEW's credit, that's right. I said it. <laughs> <laughs> to AEW's credit, they have Thunder Rosa on loan, and Thunder Rosa <laughs> has has done a lot for that division on the. But she's NWA. Side. She's NWA on loan. She that's <laughs> the only way we can see her, and NWA has to get their act together. That's right. I said that too. <laughs> I <laughs> take it all around. Uh, I was a Bailey guy from day one. I thought Bailey didn't get the credit it deserves. There's nothing about the pure strength of Bianca Belair. I think the two strongest women uh, in wrestling currently are Rhea Ripley and Bianca Belair. Uh, the, what they do with upper body and lower body strength is something I aspire to. <laughs> I, there's, there's no way I can do that. Uh, on the UK side, I'm a fan of Ginny. I think she's great. Zaya Brooks side is someone she looks sure she's like 22, 23. She has a bright future ahead of her. Um, Zaya Lee and Caden Carter. Last year, I beat the drum for those two. I was like, they're going to be big. And everyone was like, yeah, whatever, Flo Lo. But guess what? To show how good NXT Women's Division is, here is an undercard storyline. So it's not even about the title. Featuring Caden Carter and Zaya Lee. That shows you the embarrassment of riches that talent, that organization has. And, and finally, that we're seeing authentic descriptions of diversity not like hey we have one it's kind of like right. hey here's a story about people that look differently because if you don't know Kaden carter she's like uh she's like half filipina half jamaican and zai lee is like one the first female chinese uh, signed roster talent so them in a storyline not about necessarily like i'm i'm going to beat you up but like here's like you're my friend but you're my friend and you're doing this now oh, man it's the drama the path that was I <laughs> well so you must have been suffering when the uk when nxc uk went away for for a small bit then you know what i was because what i liked about uk is that it's all about nuance because on the surface everyone just wears black tights Everyone hits hard. And you're like, how can you tell people? But like, if you look and wait and see why this person does more joint manipulation, why this person's more of a rounds based wrestler. And it has this like regal thing of the coat of arms on the titles in the background. They're in these old, old venues because the UK is an old area, but it's new talent. It was the most hardest thing to describe. If you can't describe something in 10 seconds or less, then you're kind of losing people. So when, when NXT, both of them was on hiatus. And my partner, Jack, because we did after shows for After Buzz TV, he was like, we should revive the after shows. I'll do AEW, you'll do NXT. And I was like, I'm not doing NXT if I can't do UK. Because I think that brand needs the most help to really put that on a, pla- a platform and show why you should check it out. It's one week, it's one hour a week. It's cool, uh, it's it's different, and it's fresh. And so, yeah. <laughs> So you definitely did miss it then. So last, last but not least, I, and I, and I'm sorry that I'm digging so deeply into wrestling, but I'm, I'm always intrigued when I get to speak to somebody that I don't know about this. <laughs> Nerd. <laughs> what do you think about the whole, what, what do you think about the whole WrestleMania thing and them actually bringing the audience back in? You kind of have to. Um, and mm. I do think as a wrestling fan, nothing right. beats a live <laughs> crowd as a performer, nothing beats a live crowd as a business person. That's definitely the gimme that WWE is given Florida back when wrestling was deemed essential business, which mm-hmm. I still don't understand how that became essential. <laughs> I was going to go home and be like, what? <laughs> um, so I, I understand that uh, we saw the Super Bowl, you re- or even the Capitol wrestling center, having them bang on the plexiglass, gives something uh, extra to it. It makes every fight count. I understand it as someone who is really 
resigned himself to having the only social interaction at the grocery store every week and a half. I'm kind of like, are you sure Russell mania is going to be the reason? So I'm kind of in the middle, but I understand. Interesting. You're only social interact. I even order, I even order groceries and I'm so pathetic. Well, I'll share <laughs> this you with you. <laughs> I'll share this with you. I haven't shared this story on, on the air before. But a long, 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 long time ago, early 2000s, I actually used to work for Best Buy many, many years ago. Oh, okay. And I used to repair computers. And I had the actual lovely opportunity of repairing Jericho, Edge, uh, Christian, and Paul White, yeah. their computers. And it was interesting because any time that they would actually stand in line, well, it became <laughs> another line because everybody wanted to run up to them and actually kind of <laughs> interact with them. So we would normally have to pull them off to the side yeah. um, and, and actually try to kind of hide them off just to be able to get anything done that they needed to be done. And I will tell you, all of them are great. No, never really had an issue with anyone. But Jericho would stand in line and never like try to wave or try to do anything to get special attention. And not that any of the other ones did, but he really just kind of stood there as normal man as possible. But people would come up and we would try to whisk him away in doing that. And as and I have to tell you, when it comes to Paul White, <laughs> the camera does not do that man justice. He is much bigger in person than what you expect. He had to lean down to actually get in through the doorway because he was so giant. I was just always impressed. And I remember a, a customer coming up to him and asking him if he would choke slam him. And I was like, you must be out of your mind. He, of course, he didn't do it. Wow. But it was just kind, kind of amazing. But I was actually in an area in Tampa at the time that that's where everybody was kind of like hanging out. And that was a newer Best Buy store. Yeah. So hardly anybody was going there. So they would show up because they knew um, no one was there. <laughs> I, I will tell you the test showed up there a time. It was actually Black Friday, and that's when he was dating Stacy Keebler. Boy, was that a distracting day when it, when, when it was all said and done. <laughs> so basically what you're saying is if I'm famous enough, there's a VIP line at the Geek Squad. That's where I got well, to aspire to. Pretty, pretty much is, is how it works. Because they kind of like, they would drift you off to the side. But <laughs> I've never really, I've, ne <laughs> I've never said that on the air before. That's so so people, <laughs> so Flo, if people want to know more about what you're doing and everything you have going on, where can they go to find out more information? Wow. How long is this show? Because uh, <laughs> I do a lot, y'all. Uh, I have two websites. Most of my stuff is there. If you want to book me, if you're in the Southern California area, check out flobito.com. That's F L O. BITO.com. If you want more information of all the shows that I'm a hosting of, we're talking about What's Up, Flubble After Hours, Draped in Gold, Flubble Saw on Netflix, Commander's Log, the unofficial Star Trek Discovery Post Show, NewAmsterdam.com. That's K N E W Amsterdam.com. NewAmsterdam.com. Flubble, I so appreciate you coming on to the show today. Thank you for the invite. Want more of the Jay Allen Show? Go to safetyfm.com. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and its guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the company. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are only examples. They should not be utilized in the real world as the only solution available as they are based only on very limited and dated open source information. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the company. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic, recording, or otherwise without prior written permission of the creator of the podcast, Jay Allen.